Okay, welcome to, it's Friday, right? Got homecoming this weekend. I believe the game is against Oregon State. My, that's where I got my master's from. I taught there for six years, so. Uh, a few years back, I would have been rooting for them, but it's kind of like, I guess I've been here long enough now, I'll be rooting for ASU, of course. Because ASU will probably win anyway, so. That's usually how it's, uh, maybe it'll be the other way around. Okay, um, I've got 10 questions to go over. There's 11 questions on the exam, but one of these questions I'll, I'll highlight really does double duty. So by going over these 10 questions, we will actually go over the, con the types of questions you need to be able to answer for the whole test. Okay, so again, there's eight of the questions are multiple choice. You don't have to show your work, you just have to choose the right answer. Three of the questions are open essay type answers where you do have to provide your work. And some of them you might be able to find it just using a calculator or using the technology, but you, or, or using algebra, but again, it's gonna ask you to use the methods of uh, calculus, which we'll go over today. Okay, so everything we go over, I'm presenting it as if it was an open answer question so that you could go through there. Uh, and again, multiple choice, you don't have to show your work, so some of those will be easier, but we'll go through each of them. Okay, and I'm going to go backwards, so I'll go with the stuff we most recently learned, because uh, so, that also might help you with as you finish up the homework. Additionally, I did update uh, the scores in Canvas. And again, if you haven't gotten to these last ones, that's okay. It's just sort of, this is where you're at today. After the exam, I'll update again, and I'll pick up any homework that you've got going through there. And again, yes, sir. I'm sorry, did you say these were going to be like the 10 questions that were going to be on the test? Well, I don't like this, because then you're going to expect them to be exactly. They will be the type. So yes, if you know how to do these 10, you will know how to address each of the questions on the test. The functions might be a little different, um, but the, the here's what I found. Okay, turn this thing off. But yes, the cons if we if you follow this, you will be fine. You don't need to worry about well, what else is going to be on the, this? I've I I narrowed it down to what's on the test. So this is a very specific review. Uh, it's not that we don't want you to know the other stuff, but I want you to feel if I know this stuff, I will be fine on the test. Don't have to worry about extraneous stuff unless I want to. So there'll be something like this. Uh, and we didn't do this directly. We just, I presented this as a, uh, what's not, oh, I don't have it plugged in. I presented it as just one of the principles. So I'm going to do a little bit here. There we go. Um, let's go withdraw. And so what we're talking about, this function here, right, is going from 0 to 10. And there's, there's some sort of function. It's the area under this curve, right? So going from 0 to 10. What is the second function here? It's the area of the same curve going from 0 to 7. So if we take this area and subtract it from the 0 to 10, what's left? 7 to 10. So it's, that's kind of how you do it. It's, it's, there's that property that if you sort of subtract one from the other, you just have to look at what the limits are doing. Uh, so and the question like this will be, what are A and what are B? Well, A is 7 and B is 10. And again, we just sort of got it from here, uh, subtracting you know, so if I go from 0 to 10, 0 to 7, well, that means I'm going really just from 7 to 10. Okay, so that's, this is what the visual would look like. Uh, but does that property make sense? Okay, good. Okay. Know that one, and that's sort of a gimme. You know, it's kind of straightforward. Uh, then there'll be one that, like this, evaluate the integral. Uh, and uh, in terms of areas. Now when they say in terms of areas, what they're really telling us, that doesn't want to write, 
is that uh, this function that they're giving us is, is some geometric shape. Like we did one in class that was a triangle. There's one in the homework that's similar to this. And does anyone remember what this kind of a function gives us? A circle, actually a half circle uh, because it's a square root. Um, so it, it's giving us the top half of a circle. Uh, the square root of 225 is 15, so it's a circle with radius 15. So if we were to graph it, it'd be something like this. And what we just need to, re oh, that's a circle. It's got a radius of 15. How do I find the area of a circle that has a radius of 15? Pi, pi r squared, right? So don't forget, again, this is supposed to be from high school geometry. So nothing too extravagant. But be careful, um, how much of the circle do we have? half of it. So when we find this area, yes, it's going to be pi 15 squared, which is, yeah, just 225 pi. But that's for the whole circle. So we have to, oh, I've only got half of it, so I got to divide it by half. So be careful. Watch those boundaries. You might have a quarter of a circle. I would divide by four. So just, you know, be careful that you just plug it in. You get your answer. And if it's a multiple choice, you might choose the wrong one because you forgot, wait, I don't have a full circle. I've only got half of a circle, or I've only got a quarter of a circle. They're not going to give you an eighth because you can't really, right? We, we can only integrate from here. We could have gone from 0 to 15 or, you know, so we could just watch what the, the these uh, boundaries are important. This is telling us we've got the whole half circle. But if we went from 0 to 15, we'd only have a quarter of that circle. And again, sort of for security's sake, you might even want to graph this uh, with your graphing calculator. Um, and I'll, uh, let's see. Yeah, I'll go ahead and. So we could, uh, just have this ready for when we need it. Notice when I graph it, I don't see much, but that's because, you know, my window is not big enough. So we'll go from minus 20 to positive 20 just to be big enough. And I'll have my y max go to 20 as well. And then we can graph it. Graphing calculators have a little bit problem. They don't go all the way down, but you can sort of, if you forgot, here it is. Yes, it is a circle. Um, you could even with this thing, go back here. Oops. What's going on? Oh. flaked on me. But you could use that uh, second calc, use the integral. It would get it for you too, but it'll give it to you in uh, decimal form. Some of these might ask for it in decimal form, and so you'd enter it in your calculator and you'd get it in decimal form. Okay. So is that okay with that one, that type of question? I can be able to do it if it's a circle, if it's a triangle. We're kind of limited, but if you see an absolute value, what kind of a shape are you going to get? triangle, right? Either this way or that way. So 
you see the square root of some number squared minus x squared, that's a circle or half of a circle. Um, and then just watch for the boundaries. Okay. We did one like this in class. Uh, this was, uh, I don't know, 5.1 or, uh, but this, is, this was, yeah, the starting. So this is sort of like the start for Riemann sums. Uh, we've got a speedometer readings, 12 uh, second intervals. Notice they've already given us the information in feet per second. They're measuring every 12 seconds. So estimate the distance traveled by this motorcycle using velocities at the beginning of, at the beginning of the time intervals, the beginning. So is that a left or a right? To the left, right? We start at the left. We read from left to right. So it's if the beginning of the time zero, so we're going to use zero. Um, we're going to use this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. But we won't use that one, okay? Because what we're doing, again, is we're creating sort of this interval thing uh, from zero to 12, right? It, at zero, it's 20. And then at 12, it's 24. Um, and so the graph goes up, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna use from the beginning time interval, we're gonna find this area, which is gonna be 12 seconds by 20 feet, right? So 12 times 20 here. And then the next one, um, we come out at 24. Wait a minute, did I get that right? Oh wait, yeah, here. It's at 22, so that'd be about here. But again, we use the starting, so we come over like this. Okay, so this is also gonna be a 12, but it will be, um, we use this height, so it's gonna be 24. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the visual, we're uh, putting everything together. What we actually end up doing is we're just gonna take these, these pieces here, add them together, and multiply them all by 12. Okay, so, and that gives us the areas of each of those boxes. So for this one, you just 20 plus 24, plus 22, plus 26, plus 24 again. Those will give us all the heights we're gonna use for our boxes, and the, the, the widths are always 12 seconds. And so that's gonna give us our area. Let's see if I can get that calculator to work again. Okay, so what was that? 20, 24, equal to that then times 12 so 1392 if they wanted the right hand side um, they would have specified that and then we would have used uh, we would have started with this one and used all of these as our heights so we would have added all those y values together and then multiplied by 12. So just watch for whether they're calling for the left side or the right side. Um, beginning of time intervals would be the left side. Uh, they, they could ask for the midpoint, but they won't because we don't really have midpoints, do we? We don't, we need a function to be able to do midpoints. Okay, so with, with data like this, it's actually a lot easier. We're just using that data but I want you to see the picture where it's coming from so that you're not just memorizing use these or, or those because, again, 
you could do the right process, but if we used, you know, we used the red ones I've got marked, we would have gotten this answer wrong because we used the wrong intervals. Questions on that one? Okay, so know how to do that one. Okay. This one, I didn't review it, so it's, uh, there's one like this. A particle moves on a straight line, it has an acceleration, right, of 36t plus 10. That's its acceleration. The position at time t equals zero is s equals eight, s of zero equals eight, and its velocity at time t equals zero is the velocity is v of zero is equal to nine. And then they want to know what is its position at t equals six. I don't quite remember how to do this, but uh, so what is what is acceleration, velocity, and position? What are the relationships? Let's start with how we kind of. If I had the position, how do I get the velocity? The der first derivative. If I've got the the velocity, how do I get to the acceleration? the second derivative of the position function. So the position function is, is two times back. Um, and uh, so what do we need to do? Well, we want to get what is its position at time t equals 6. We know it starts at 8. So position is 0, 8 when it starts. We know its velocity at time zero is nine, um, and so that would be nine feet per second, something like that, and then it's accelerating at any given time. Is the acceleration going, is it getting faster or slower? Faster, why? Po yeah, the, the positive slope, 36t, so as time goes on, it's gonna get faster and get there. Um, so how can we, where, what would we do? Okay, so to get to the velocity, so remembering velocity is a second derivative, um, if we get its antiderivative, that means we've gotten back to velocity, we've gotten to its speed, so let's do that. So that tells us V of T, now, how do we get the antiderivative? Okay, so opposite, instead of sub derivative, you subtract one from the exponent. You multiply first and then subtract one. So for antiderivative, what we're going to do is we're going to add to the exponent first, and instead of multiplying by the exponent, we're going to divide by that new exponent, one plus one. So I, uh, let's move it down here. V of t is going to be equal 36 divided by 2. Thank you. <laughs> it's a simple math that gets me when I'm doing these things. And then 1 plus 1 is 2. Okay, I just had to verify sometimes. And then what happens with 10? Remember, that's really t to the 0 power, so we add 1 to that. So we're also going to get plus 10t divided by one, but 10 divided by one is still 10. So far, so good? What did I forget? Plus C. Plus C. And uh, this is where this information here is gonna come in. It's gonna allow us to figure out what that C is, because we're gonna need that if we're gonna take another uh, antiderivative and get to the velocity. So you, you see that some of these, like this particular one is really at least two questions in one. We gotta do two antiderivatives. So to find C, what we do is we plug in zero for T because we know V of zero, oops, V of zero equals nine. So what we get is 18 zero squared plus 10 zero plus C. And notice this is zero, this is zero. So C equals nine, does that help? See, it makes it a little bit quicker for the next one. We'll do that too. So, let's see, let me come over here so it's all on the same screen. Um, 
So what we know is that we've got the velocity function is 18 t squared plus 10 t plus 9. But that's not, we, we're not done yet, right? We need the position function, which they're telling us is s of t. And remember, this is one step up above, so we need another, we need the antiderivative of the velocity function. So what's that going to be? <coughs> Plus one here, and then we're going to divide by three. Right, two plus one is three. 18 divided by three, six t to the third. Uh, here again, we're going to have to add one and then divide by one plus one is two. 10 divided by two is five t squared plus nine t. So remember, when we have a constant, we're getting the antiderivative. It's just going to be the constant times uh, the variable. Is that OK? Because it was t to the 0. And then plus a constant. But since we know the y-intercept, right, is equal to 8, plug in 0, 0, 0, we're going to get 8. So before going through it all, putting a plus c, we could actually just put a plus 8. Now, if they gave us like s of 1, we'd have to plug in that 1 and then figure out c. But they were kind of nice to us, plus 8. Now, what's left to do? Plug in t for 6, and we will have our position. So we, we had to go through all those steps. We just now need to find s of 6. 6 cubed plus 5 times 6 squared plus 9 times 6 plus 8. Plug that in a calculator, you got your answer. Okay? You okay with that? And so that's, do that and you're, you're good. Okay, so you'll be able to address that. So you need to be able to take an antiderivative um, and just, just for security's sake or to make you feel a little bit more that a lot of the questions on the tests are very similar to these, but with just different numbers, slightly different. So um, I guess they've heard and understood. It's, some of these are like directly out of the homework as well. So if you've done the homework, you'll, you'll be good. Any questions on this one? OK. So here's another one. Um, they give us the derivative, right? And they want us to find the function that it came from. They want us to find the antiderivative. Um, and they give us an initial condition, which hopefully should help us find that, that value of c. Okay. So what would be the antiderivative of this function? Well, what's, if I've got a cosine, how did I get a cosine? I must have took the derivative of sine. Derivative of sine is cosine. So the 3 kind of just goes along for the ride. So this is this now 3 sine. That's its antiderivative. If I have negative sine, how did I get negative sine? Positive cosine. So a positive cosine gives us a negative sine. So I'm going to change this to a plus 9 cosine. Okay, so there'll be a, again, just like this is sort of the, the extent of the trig that we're going to have you do as an antiderivative at this point. We're not going to throw anything real tricky at you, but just know sine and cosine, and just know when you do the antiderivative, you've got to get your negatives straight. Uh, and then there's one more thing I left out, which I usually left out plus a c. So then what we have to do here is find what c is, because we know that when we plug in 0 for x, we're going to get negative 2. So we put negative 2 is equal to 3 sine of 0 plus 9 cosine of 0 plus c. What's sine of 0? 0. So here again, you're going to need to remember some of your trig function values, nothing too extreme. Or if you don't remember, plug it in, right? Plug it in the calculator. So this part is 0. A cosine of 0, though, is 1. So 1 times 9 is 9. 
plus c equals negative 2. Uh, subtract 9 from both sides, right? And that gives us negative 11 is equal to c. So what we want to be careful on our final answer, we want to list f of x equals 3 sine x plus 9 cosine x minus 11. Okay, so have that all there. And again, remember this is a multiple choice. They might just show it without the minus 11. Uh, and you might, you know, you get there, oh, there's my answer, I'm done. But they, they gave us the extra information to get what that C is. Okay, so sometimes that's the trickiest part of the multiple choice is the distractors are sometimes very good. Question on that one? Okay, okay. Um, this is one of the ones in the section that uh, was a little bit more difficult because there's a lot of problem solving. But again, on the test, we're just going to have you be able to figure out the area of a rectangle, the formula for area of a rectangle. So we didn't get too complicated with this. Um, a fence is to be built and includes rectangle area of 320 square feet. Uh, the fence along three sides is to be made of material that costs $3 per foot, and the four side costs $14 per foot. Find the width, the width is smaller than the length, in feet of the enclosure that is most economical to construct to have four, uh, to four decimal places. Now, let's just think of it. We've got a, a rectangle, right? So this is what a rectangle looks like. And this one is one where the width is smaller than the length. We know that the area has to be 320, uh, 320 uh, and that's equal to the width times the length. Uh, where do you want to put the $14 side, the material that costs 14 which side should that be on? On one of the width sides, right? Because that's going to be the smaller. That's going to, so part of this is just problem solving that uh, we'll choose one side to cost $14, so whatever this is, this is going to be 14 times W, right? And then the length, that side's gonna cost $3, so this will be 3W, three, or sorry, 3L, 3W, and um, three length. So that's gonna give us our cost, right? right? So we kinda got it there. So our cost is a function that is, let's just do this, six, six times the length, right, 3L plus 3L, um, plus 3W times 14W, um, 17W, and we want to minimize that. So that's one function. What's the other function? Area. area, which is simply width times length equals 320. And we're gonna use this one to substitute back into other to kind of see what we end up with. Um, and what is the question? Find the width, we want to find the width. So what we do is this is kind of backwards, but we want to solve the area function for L, for the length, because then when we substitute in for the length, we're left with the W. It'll just allow us to get the answer in one step instead of having to find the length and then go back and find the width. So I'm gonna solve this for L. Divide both sides by W. So L is equal to 320 divided by W. So I'm gonna substitute that, substitute this in for L. So the function we're gonna work with is six times 320 over W plus 17 W is equal to the cost function, C of W. We want to minimize this, so um, here we 
could use algebra. We could actually just graph this at this point, right, and find maybe that would be using algebra. Um, but let's go ahead and do that because, again, if it's multiple choice, we could just do that and be done. Um, but we'll also go through in case they want us to show the calculus steps. So what do we got? We've got... got, uh, and I didn't multiply it out, I could, but I'll just do 6 times 320 divided by x, what was it, plus 17x, uh, right, and, oops, it's, uh, there we go, I'm going to graph it. Uh, let's do a zoom yeah let's just zoom out We don't really need any dimensions that would be zero, right? So let's see if this helps us see the graph. Should be a positive cost though, shouldn't it? Oh, I see what you see. Okay. Why am I not seeing it? There's something wrong with what I've got. You did zoom zero? Zoom box? Zoom zero? Oh, okay. That's what I was looking for. Okay. So thank you. So there's a on the listing it's at it's actually number ten after nine, so, it's, so there is a zoom fit and all else fails, use them fit, and it'll find it. So I can see there is a minimum here. Uh, I could go second calc, uh, minimum, and I move the, it needs a left bound, so I need to go to the left of the minimum, go all that way, I'll put enter there, and then I need a right bound, which is to the right of the minimum, go over there, enter, and then it wants a guess, I hit enter for a guess, easier to read up there. And our minimum is that if the width is 10.6273, where's that say? 10.6273. Actually, the three gets rounded up to a four. What was that, six, three, seven? Two, seven. Six two seven four. Six two seven four. And the answers for these, of course, are in the. I took this is all coming from the Math two sixty five website. So this is the review questions, and they have the answers in there. Um, if they wanted to know the minimum cost, that's the y value. Well, yeah, that would be the y value. Um, how would we find this? Like if this was an open answer when they said, we want you to use calculus, how would we have done that? How do we get a minimum, or how do we know we have a minimum with calculus? Take a derivative, 
set the derivative equal to zero. That's going to give us a minimum or a maximum. In this case, we saw from the graph it's got to be a maximum. So we'd want to take the first derivative. Again, if it was a multiple choice, we got our answer, we can match it, we're done. We don't have to go into the calculus. But if it's one of the open answer ones and they say use calculus and we want to see calculus, at least now we know we got the right answer, so we, that's the harder part. We could still use our calculator, right? So uh, derivative of 17w, I'll do that part first, is just 17. The derivative of 6 times 320 over w, um, let's see, is going to be, what's 6 times 320? It's going to be 12, carry the 1, 18, 19, 19, 20. So we have 19, 20 over w. Remember, that's w to the minus 1 power. So when you take its derivative, it's going to become negative 19, 20. That's negative 1 times 19, 20. And then when we subtract 1, it's going to become w to the minus 2, which we can move down here. And then again, we want to solve this for where is this equal zero. Um, so then you would subtract 17 from both sides. So you get negative 19, 20 over w squared equals negative 17. I would multiply both sides by w squared just to get the variable up on the line. Divide both sides by seven, negative 17. That's what w squared is. And then take the square root of both sides. And since w has to be positive, we take the, the positive square root, right? When you take a square root of both sides, you're getting a plus or minus answer. But we want the positive answer. So it's going to be the square root of whatever 19, 20 over 17 is. Okay, take that square root. And that'll get you to your answer too. And then again, use the calculator. We want to verify that that actually ends up being 10.6274. Okay, now the open answer, I'm more concerned with you having some work there. So if, if it's not correctly rounded to the right decimal places, if it's off for a few, I don't care. If it's a multiple choice, they're not going to give you 10.73, you know, they're not going to make it off by one decimal place. So, but, um, so you'll be able to get close enough either way. Okay with that one? Okay, so know how to minimum or maximum, so we're going to take that first derivative. Um, and we're good. Now this is the one that is sort of a double duty question. It, it fills two places. This one is asking us two questions, really. It's asking us where is it concave up or concave down, and then to identify where the inflection point is. The thing is, is to get concave up and concave down, we, we kind of need to find the inflection point as well. Uh, so, uh, but on the test, it's two separate questions. So just, that's why I only have 10 questions here. Let's keep moving so we get through this. Okay, so um, how do we find where something's concave up or concave down? Second derivative is the easiest way. You can do it with the first derivative, but the second derivative definitely does. Wherever the second derivative is positive, we've got concave up because that makes you happy. Wherever it's concave down, it's negative because that makes you frown, right? Um, so the first derivative, 6 comes down, we get 12x to the fifth. 6 times 2, right? Uh, and here, 5 comes down, 5 times 7 is 35, x to the fourth. But we need the second derivative. 5 times 12 is 60, x to the fourth. And then this is 4 times 35 is 140, x to the third. 
Where do we find, so, so we need to find sort of two things. If we find the inflection point, what will, what qualities that inflection point have regards to the second derivative? Second derivative would be equal to zero. So we'll find that and then we'll look to the left and we'll look to the right to see, because if we've got an inflection point on one side, it's concave up, the other is concave down, we just gotta figure which way. So we set this equal to zero. What I would do is I would, I can factor out an x to the third. And let's see, 60 and 40 have a, a common 10, 10 goes into both and um, six and four, uh, 20 goes into both. So I can factor out a 20, 20 to 60 divided by 20 is three. 140 divided by 20 is gonna be seven. So I've got two solutions. I have the first part here, x equals zero is one solution. The other one is 3x minus 7 equals 0. When I solve that, I've got to get x equals, add 7 to both sides, divide by 3, I'm going to get 7 thirds is our other solution. So I have two places where this equals 0. Um, two possible inflection points. And so then what I do, so interval notation indicate where it's concave up and where is it concave down. And again, I would suggest go ahead and graph the original so you can kind of see it and then you can kind of verify and, and you'll see that, yeah, x equals zero looks like a place where there'd be an, in, um, an inflection point. What we can do then is plug in a point just to the left, right? So we could plug in uh, x equals negative one into the second derivative. Um, and again, we're just looking for the sign, what sign we get, whether it's positive or negative. So if we plug in a negative one for the 60, we're gonna, or, or to this part, we get, uh, well maybe I'll write it out, 60, negative one to the fourth, minus 140, negative one to the third. This is going to be positive one times 60, so this is positive 60. When we take it to the third power, it's still negative, a negative times a negative is positive. We don't have to figure it out all the way, but we know to the left it's positive. So it's concave up to the left of zero. Does that make sense? This kind of, here's my x-axis, when x is zero, this has a positive second derivative. If I go to the right of zero, and seven thirds is, uh, what, that's about two and a third. So I'll go to positive, I'll, I'll look at what happens at x equals one. And when I plug in x equals one, I get 60, one to the fourth, so that's gonna be positive. But what happens to this 140, this is staying, going to stay negative, so I get 60 minus 140. I get a negative value. So to the right of zero, I get a negative. I'm concave down. So I'll just put down, up. And then I have the other place, 7 thirds. And I could plug in a point to the right of that because I know that in between there's got to be um, two. Two's a good number? No, two's not big enough. Three? Three's the, probably the biggest one. So then I plug in three, and I could just see, okay, three to the fourth times 60, that's going to be positive. Uh, three cubed is going to be positive, so that's negative. So what I got to figure out is uh, 60 three to the fourth minus 140, three to the third. Which one is bigger, right? I think that's 60 times three to the 
force is going to be bigger. So that's going to make it positive again, which is kind of good because then that's what an inflection point, right? We need this sign change. And again, that's where I might look at the graph and just kind of fudge it a little bit. So the bottom line is what's our answer? Well, it, it asks uh, where is it concave up? So concave up, we'll just do CU, is from negative infinity until zero. And then it's concave down for a while. And then it's from 7 thirds to positive infinity. Okay, Be concave down in the middle part, which would be from zero to 7 thirds. Where's our inflection points? Zero and seven thirds. So notice we we had to find them anyway. So uh, just, I guess on the test you ask they, they ask it as two separate questions. Uh, so you basically end up doing the same sort of things for two different types of functions. Okay, inflection points. Is when x equals zero or seven thirds. Okay, so second derivative test. Keep going. We run out of, well, let's not jinx ourselves, but we probably will run out of time, right? Uh, I do have office hours, and then what I will do is I'm recording this, I'll post this, I'll do the last few ones. Let's see. Oh, there's only three left. We might make it. I'm not betting on it, but anyway. Okay, we'll try to go a little faster. So we got the function 1 over x on this interval from 1 to 12, find the values of C that satisfy the conclusion of the mean value theorem to four decimal places. What's the mean value theorem say? The left and right boundaries, if you get that average rate of change, sort of the, the slope of the secant line, that somewhere in there, the derivative will be equal to that same value. Okay, so what we do, is, so we're going from 1 to 12, so we find the endpoints. So when x is 1, what is y? Um, 1 over 1 is 1. So we've got the one endpoint is 1, 1. The other endpoint is 12. When you plug in 12 for x, you get 1 over 12. Does that make sense? Okay, so those are our two points. Those are two endpoints. And what we need to do is find the slope between those two points. So I'll start with this one. I'll do uh, 1 over 12 minus 1. Those are the y values. 12 minus 1, that's the x values. Uh, if you have 1 12th minus 1, think of 1 as being 12 over 12. So they have a common denominator. That's going to give you negative 11 twelfths over 11. It's kind of a cool thing. And then uh, when you divide by the bottom, this is going to be negative 11 twelfths times 1 over 11, inverting the bottom, which is 11 over 1. So the 11s cancel out. What we get is the slope is negative 1 twelfth. Okay. Good. Now what's the mean value theorem say? It says if we take the derivative of this, that there is a point where that derivative will be equal to negative 1 12th. Okay, so what's the derivative of 1 over x? Right, remember that's x to the minus 1. Negative 1 over x squared. Okay, because you subtract 1. Okay, negative 1 over x squared. So what we're saying is that's got to be equal to negative 1 over 12 somewhere. Multiply both sides by negative 1 so to get rid of the negative. Invert both sides, and you get that x squared equals 12. Does that make sense? You could cross multiply. Or, there are many ways you could do it. But, and then how do we get solve for x? Just square root of both sides. And so we get, and again, uh, since we're on the interval from 1 to 12, although we get a plus or minus answer, negative square root of 12 doesn't make, is not in our interval. So we just get the square root of 12. 
in the answer key, that's not it. They actually take the square root of 12 because they want it to four decimal places, so then they give you the decimal equivalent, not the exact answer. Okay, so I'll, I'll let you do that part, but that's the correct answer. Okay, so there's a question like that. How did we find that's the point where, and again, there could be more than one, but they just found, find one, okay? I'm gonna keep moving. Uh, if there's questions, please come to office hours afterwards. Uh, ooh. I might get kicked out. Um, actually, again, this one's not. Let me do this. I'll, I'll do a video for these last two. But uh, basically, you can graph this, and you'll see there's a maximum point. Okay, and again, if it's, an, if it's a multiple choice question, that's all you need. Uh, if it's an open answer, then you need to show that you can take the derivative and set the derivative equal to zero. Notice this is gonna be a quotient rule, so it's gonna be a little involved. I'll take my time on that one. And then the last one, we're given a function. What's the closed interval method? For finding maximums and minimums. Find the endpoints and find any places the first derivative equals zero and figure out which ones are your absolute minimums and absolute maximums. Okay? So it's just that don't forget about the endpoints. Again, I'll make little videos with the last two. I'll post those along with this, but know those and you'll be you'll be golden. There's 11 questions, and the, the one I pointed out was really two. There's one that asks you intervals where us concave up and down, and then there's a separate question that asks you where's the inflection point. I do, and I've got it here if you want. It's, it's the Riemann sums.